Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Last time we finished everything that needs to be done in order to construct a grid of rustums which will be used for light culling. However, we weren't quite able to successfully run the application because of an error and we need to find out what's causing it first before we can continue. So today we are going to try and fix this issue and after that we are going to check if the generated frustum planes have sensible values. When we try to run the program, we get this exception and this is because the device was removed for some reason. Unfortunately, the error message doesn't specify what the reason is and that's obviously what we need to find out now. Let's not write to the frustums buffer and see if that helps. Okay, that's our confirmation that something in the compute shader is causing the crash. Specifically, writing to the frustums buffer seems to be the problem. Could it be that the buffer is not in a writable state? Let's apply the last barrier which is supposed to be applied by the calling function and see what happens. Looks like it made it even worse now. Let's have a look at the shader again. So we calculate an index for the frustums array to write each frustum and the index could be out of range, which would also result in a device removed situation. And indeed, we need to return if x and y are greater than or equal to num threads, of course. It's almost always such a small oversight that makes us waste a lot of time. But I'm glad we found the issue which should now be fixed. Aha, we are trying to apply an empty array of barriers. This is why I'm always generous with sprinkling assertions everywhere. Looking in the call stack, we can exactly find where this is happening, which is in call light function. This also makes sense because after the initial grid frustum construction, we are not calling this function anymore and therefore there is no barrier to be applied. So we can comment this out for now. The first few times that we do have a barrier, it will be applied by one of the functions later in the rendering pipeline. Awesome, we are back in business. Let me also turn off switching between light sets. Okay, what I'd like to do next is to find a way to visualize frustum planes so that we can see if we can reason about how they look and if they make sense. We can try and pass our frustum data to the post-processing stage, where we can read from the buffer and color the pixels accordingly. Here we can use conditional compilation to select between things that we want to see, starting with visualizing the tile indices. As we'll see in one of the later episodes, in order to use our lighting data in the pixel shader, we must be able to determine the tile to which the current pixel belongs and use that to index into the light index buffer. The code that I'm going to write next shows how that can be done. Of course we need to be aware of the screen dimensions, so we can calculate where the pixel is relative to the screen. Therefore we need to pass global shader data to the post-processing step. We are also going to read from the frustums buffer, so let's add it as well. This time it doesn't need to be a read-write buffer, because we are only going to read from it. So it's going to be a structured buffer and attached as a shader resource, which maps to a T register. Obviously this is going to be only for visualization and we are going to remove it later. Now that we have access to screen width and height, we can determine which tile the current pixel belongs to if we also know the size of each tile. In this case, I'm not going to define the tile size through compiler options in C++ code like we did for grid frustums compute shader, because this is supposed to be temporary. If later it turns out that we need it for something, we can always add it as a compile time definition. 
We can calculate the number of tiles in the x direction by dividing the screen width by the tile size and rounding up the result to the nearest integer value. This is what the ceiling function does. The x and y coordinates of the tile that contains this pixel can be calculated by simply dividing the pixel position by the tile size. Note that this is an integer division, which will round the resulting value down to the nearest integer. From this we can calculate the index at which we can read the frustum that belongs to this tile. Because I'm going to visualize this index as a gray color, I'm going to multiply it by a small number. Now if the index is a multiple of 2 in x or y directions, we make the tile's color brighter. Finally, we return it as a gray color. Before we can run this shader, we need to include our data types. We also need to update the root signature so that we can pass the buffers as root parameters. So we need to add new enumerations to root parameter indices and update the root parameters in postprocess.cpp. Again, we'll attach global shader data as a constant buffer, which is only visible to the pixel shader stage. And we also attach a shader resource view with the same visibility. In the postprocess function, we need to get the light calling ID in order to be able to ask for the frustums buffer. We can set the global shader data as before. And obviously we need to have something that we can call to get the GPU virtual address of the frustums buffer. Let's add a function in D3D12 light calling, which will return the frustums buffer from a light calling ID and the frame index. In the CPP file, we can simply index into light colors and return the frustums GPU address. Now we can call this function in postprocess after including the light calling header that is. And of course we can't escape the fact that I make a lot of typos which need fixing. Running the shader triggers the debug layer, which tells us that the frustums buffer is not in the correct state for being read by a pixel shader. Which makes sense because we created that buffer in a state that can be only used by compute shaders. In order to make it available to pixel shaders, we need to add a pixel shader resource flag. So it's now both a non-pixel shader resource and also a pixel shader resource. Again, this is temporary, since the frustums buffer is only going to be used by compute shaders. Now we can see that we are calculating the tiles correctly. What we see here is just a gray tone that depends on each tile's row and column. Now that we know that tiles look correct, we can use tile indices to read from the frustums buffer. So the next block is for frustum visualization.
I'm going to write a function that calculates the frostum index from the screen width and the pixel's position. This is exactly the same thing as we just did, except that I'm substituting the idx variable into the index calculation. We can use this index to read the frostum data for this tile from the buffer. Each frostum has four planes, which have their normal vector. The normal vectors can be treated as RGB colors if you take the absolute value of each component. Then we can divide each tile in four segments and color each segment using absolute normal values of each plane. To do this, we determine to which quarter of the tile this pixel belongs and set its color accordingly. And then we can linearly interpolate between the actual scene and this grid. For now, I'll use the full grid color just to show you what the frostum plane normals look like. Again, we've got to fix the typos before we can compile the shader. It crashed because I forgot to use parentheses when substituting the IDX variable. Unlike floating point values, integer division and multiplication are not distributive because of the rounding. Now we can see each tile divided in four quarters. The red squares are the left and right planes, and the green squares are the top and bottom planes. We can tell quickly which is which because left and right planes have a larger X component, which is mapped to the red channel, while the top and bottom planes have a larger Y component, and that's mapped to the green channel. We can also see that the center of the screen is almost pure red and pure green. That's because the normals here have the smallest Z component, mapped to blue, whereas near the edges, the planes are more oblique and therefore have a bit of Z component in their normals. We can see this more clearly when we zoom in. Here the squares near the edges are pink and have more blue in their green, while the center is pure red and green. Of course our scene is still being rendered underneath, so I can make this a bit see-through so we can see the scene as well. Another way of inspecting the data during rendering is by using a program such as RenderDoc. There's also PIX for Windows and NVIDIA's Insight, and I'm sure AMD has got something too, but I can't remember. Anyway, RenderDoc is actually a cool application that we can use to capture what happens during one or more frames of a graphics application. It supports OpenGL, Vulkan, and Direct3D, which makes it perfect for our renderer. And it's a free and open source software that you can download from renderdoc.org. This is not going to be a tutorial on RenderDoc, since it would take multiple videos. Instead, I'm going to show you how you can inspect your data using this application. First, we need to run our application using the Launch Application tab. Here, you can also configure how the application is allowed to run. For this example, I just pointed to our engine test application and hit launch. The game windows appear to be larger than what we are used to because I zoomed in so it's easier for us to read the text in RenderDoc. 
I'll close all windows except one. Here we can see that it's running like normal, but now we have this heads up display on top with info about the graphics API, frame number and frame time. Next we can capture a frame. We have the option to capture a frame immediately, after some delay or even capture a frame with a specific frame number. We'll go with capture immediately since it doesn't really matter in this case. After pressing this button we see that it captured the frame with about 100 megabytes of data. We could continue and capture more frames if we want, but right now we can go ahead and close the engine test. When the application is closed, RenderDoc will process and show the data for the captured frame. Here we can inspect the textures that are used. In our application, the only textures are the render target and the stencil texture, so there's not a lot to see here. We can also see what's going on at each pipeline stage during the frame. We can walk through all steps in each frame using this timeline. Here we see the depth prepass and the color pass, for example. In the mesh viewer, the current vertex and index buffers for each draw call can be inspected. And here on the left side we can see a list of all API calls that were made during the frame. Now if we want to see the content of any GPU resource, we can open Resource Inspector where we are presented with a list of all resources. Here we can select the resource we want to inspect by double clicking it. The selected resource title here is changed accordingly. Since we want to see the grid frustums buffer content, we select it and click on view content button. Here we see the data in the buffer as hexadecimal integer values. This is because RenderDoc doesn't know what the data format is for this buffer. Luckily, it's rather easy to specify this by just writing the format in C language. Remember that our frustums have four planes and each plane has a normal and a distance value. We can simply write that here and click apply. Now it's showing us the values in this format. You can see for yourself that the normal values have a length of 1. Also note how the distance values are really close to 0. Note that the signs of the x component for left and right planes point to the right and left respectively. Likewise, the signs of the y component for top and bottom planes point down and up. As we saw before, normals near the center have their z component close to zero, whereas normals near the edges have larger positive and negative z components. This was all for grid frustums calculation. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and learned something new. In the next episode, we are going to write our light calling shader and use it for lighting. It will have basically the exact same steps as we took for the grid frustums, but obviously it serves a different purpose. As always, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!